The Norfolk-based aircraft carrier USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, CVN-69, and its carrier strike group left for a scheduled deployment yesterday, October 13th. And once they transit the Atlantic Ocean and enter the Mediterranean Sea, it will bring a second carrier group into the Sixth Fleet area of responsibility as the war between Israel and Hamas continues to escalate. As a reminder, in the last episode, I detailed the Ford Carrier Strike Group's move from the waters around Italy to the Eastern Med, where they are now conducting presence ops designed to both deter Hamas and prevent the war from escalating further. I put the link to that episode in the description below, so if you haven't seen it, check it out. And like Ford's strike group, the Eisenhower strike group consists of an aircraft carrier, the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, which is the second oldest Nimitz-class carrier commissioned in 1977, a guided missile cruiser, the USS Philippine Sea, and a couple of guided missile destroyers, the USS Gravely and the USS Mason. On a personal note, I deployed aboard Eisenhower in the 91-92 time frame when I was in my second fighter squadron, VF-143, the Puking Dogs, and have logged more than 100 arrested landings in the backseat of F-14Bs while operating from that carrier. Carrier Air Wing 3 is aboard Ike and has basically the same mix of airplanes as CAG-8 aboard Ford, already on station in the East Med, which is four fighter squadrons, three single-seat Super Hornet squadrons, and one two-seat Super Hornet squadron, which, on another personal note, happens to be my first squadron, the Swordsman of VFA-32, although it was just VF-32 back when we were flying the Tomcat. The Swordsmen have an impressive history, including the Korean War mission, where a pilot named Tom Hudner intentionally crashed his airplane in an attempt to save the life of his downed squadron mate, Jesse Brown. At the NAS Oceana Air Show a few weeks ago, I took this picture of a VFA-32 airplane that has Hudner and Brown's names on the canopy rail, which is a classic way to commemorate that historic event. The Air Wing also has an advanced early warning squadron, an electronic attack squadron, a carrier onboard delivery squadron, and two helicopter squadrons. And since this channel will never miss an opportunity to celebrate the life and times of the F-14, I'll point out that CAG-3 is led by two Tomcat alums. The Air Wing commander is Captain Mitchell Bomber McAllister, who flew with the fighting checkmates of VF-211 in support of both Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Iraqi Freedom. The deputy Air Wing commander, Captain Marvin Scott, flew with the VF-103 Jolly Rogers in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom, which was the squadron's last F-14 deployment. And the commander of the Eisenhower Strike Group, Rear Admiral Mark Maguez, is also a Tomcat alum. In fact, we were squadron mates in VF-102, the Diamondbacks, when he was a junior lieutenant and I was a lieutenant commander back in the late 90s. This is the first deployment for Eisenhower in more than two years. It concluded its most recent deployment in July of 2021, and during that cruise, the Air Wing flew sorties against ISIS and provided close air support during the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan. That deployment was also the second leg of a so-called double pump, where the ship and Air Wing were quickly sent back on cruise after returning from deployment in August of 2020. That back-to-back tasking was hard on the carrier, and it needed an extended yard period to fix the wear and tear. Ike was originally scheduled to pass through the Met and transit the Suez Canal southbound to take station in the 5th Fleet area of responsibility, but the Israel-Hamas war will most likely change that plan, although of course the Navy won't comment on ships' movements. Now that the carrier is underway for the deployment, the first thing it will do is hang off the coast of the U.S. for a couple of days as the air wing flies aboard and pilots reestablish their carrier landing currency both during the day and at night. Once that's done, the airplanes will be chained to the deck and stowed in the hangar bay, and the ship will transit east for five or six days without conducting any flight ops. During that time, the maintainers will work on the airplanes, and the air crew will conduct training and do mission planning. Once Ike is within divert range of the Azores, the air wing will start flying again. As the Eisenhower Strike Group passes through the Straits of Gibraltar, they'll enter the Sixth Fleet area of responsibility. Sixth Fleet is currently commanded by Vice Admiral Thomas Ishii, and he'll give the order for where Ike will go. There are basically three options. Backfill Ford Station in the Adriatic in support of NATO's operations associated with the war in Ukraine, join the Ford in the Eastern Med, or keep going through the Med, southward through the Suez Canal and eventually into the North Arabian Sea and Persian Gulf as a signal to Iran. As I mentioned, the U.S. Navy will not say which of those three options will be carried out, and it may not even be decided yet. The inherent flexibility of carrier strike groups allows shifts between them at any time. And overall, Navy officials are attempting to downplay recent ships' movements. On the pier before boarding the carrier for departure, Rear Admiral Maiguez advised the assembled press not to view Eisenhower's deployment as a reaction to chaos in the Middle East, but as a routine and planned operation that happens to coincide with it. 
And speaking of that chaos, meanwhile, Israel appears to be preparing for a ground assault into the Gaza Strip. 360,000 reservists were mobilized within 48 hours of the Hamas terror raids against a music festival and neighborhoods in southern Israel that resulted in the deaths of 1,300 citizens and the capture of about 150 more. The deadliest single day for Jews worldwide since the Holocaust. The IDF has amassed tanks and armored personnel carriers along the border with the Gaza Strip as the Air Force continues strikes against targets around Gaza City, where Hamas is headquartered, including one Israeli sources claim killed a top leader who planned the October 7th attacks. The IDF also said that they had conducted commander raids into Gaza to find where hostages might be held and had engaged Hamas fighters during those raids. Israeli Air Force aircraft dropped leaflets over northern Gaza, directing the residents in Gaza City to evacuate south of the Gaza River, quote, for their own safety and protection, end quote. Hamas leadership responded by calling on Palestinians to, quote, remain steadfast in your homes and stand firm, end quote. Hamas also set up checkpoints to the south that stymied the flow of civilians wanting to get out of harm's way. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin was in Israel on Friday for meetings with senior government leaders and to see firsthand some of the U.S. weapons and security assistance that Washington rapidly delivered to Israel in the first week of the war. Austin met with the Prime Minister, the Minister of Defense, and the Israeli War Cabinet. Austin said he wants to underscore America's unwavering support for the people of Israel and that the United States is committed to making sure the country has what it needs to defend itself. The U.S. has already given Israel small diameter bombs as well as interceptor missiles for its sophisticated Iron Dome system that has been taxed to its limits in the past week as Hamas has launched thousands of rockets at southern Israel. However, America's direct military support for the Israeli military beyond existing stockpiles is in jeopardy due to the fact that there isn't a permanent speaker of the House of Representatives, which prevents votes for foreign aid being brought to the floor. The American Defense Secretary's visit follows that of Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who has been conducting a whirlwind tour of moderate states across the Mideast. He met with Jordan's King Abdullah II to, among other agenda items, secure landing rights for U.S. Air Force jets there, and then sat down with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, who has a home in Amman, which is the Jordanian capital, to reinforce that America's support for Israel's war against Hamas isn't support for a war against Palestinians. Lincoln also met with the leaders of Qatar, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia, who just paused normalization talks with Israel, a development that certainly pleases Hamas, as well as their benefactors in Iran. The Secretary of State will continue his swing across the Middle East through the weekend, stopping in UAE and Egypt before returning to the U.S. Overall, Secretary Blinken's efforts in the region are to ensure the conflict between Israel and Hamas doesn't spread. His concerns are well-founded as pro-Palestinian protests have broken out across Europe and the United States as Israel's ground assault on Gaza looms. More on this situation as the information becomes available, so if you're not already a subscriber, become one so you don't miss anything. And if you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the super thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash wardcarroll. In the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.